everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. With me, as always, is my trusted friend, Michael Walker. Hayden Walker. Fantastic, Mark. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and we are proud to announce that this week is the beginning of Phase 2. What is Phase 2, you might ask, being an underwear gnome, or indeed any number of people? Phase 2 is what we'd like to call the post-award phase here at So Very Wrong About Games, more colloquially known as phoning it in. So, Walker, what was our Eurus? A game. What'd you play last week? Some games. What's in the news, Walker? A game. Our topic this week is fun. What's fun, Walker? Playing games. All right, we out. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About... So, first of all, we have some podcast news. After considerable consideration and feedback from our listeners, we have regretfully decided to scrap Phase 2. I had high hopes, but uh, the, the early response has been very negative. I agree. It is a shame. Oh, well. So exactly one year ago, we played a game called Black Angel. This was sort of a re-implementation or sort of a sister game to Twa, the designer of Twa. He wanted to do a sci-fi game, so he brought out a game called Black Angel. And I have not really uh, much urge to go back to it, but I remember I have fond memories of it being a very interesting and unique uh, design for sure. So the three designers of Black Angel and of Trois, Sébastien Dujardin, Xavier Georges, and Alain Urbain, I'm a fan of a variety of their works, though usually not together. Like Trois and Black Angel are okay, as far as I'm concerned. Xavier Georges did Ginkopolis. I'm a big fan of Ginkopolis. Alain Urbain is going to be doing Hippocrates, which I know you've pledged for on Kickstarter Walker. And I like their work, and there are clever bits to Black Angel and Trois, but... Eh. There is. It was this very interesting sort of, you had to, you could get more dice for your dice pool. But the interesting part was it had like all these worker placement or engine building spots, but they'd like be spit out of the mothership and you had to like <laughs> chase them down and try to score off them before they rolled off the end of the conveyor belt. I thought that was very interesting. Oh my. I'll just say, how about I, Mark, you should just get a recording of me saying interesting over and over again, because yeah, apparently that's the only That and fantastic would cover many of my podcasting needs. So very unique, very cool mechanisms. I would play Black Angel again, but have not had an urge to do so. The constant need to travel to get to places was indeed interesting for a sort of Euro point builder sort of deal. And it reminded me a lot of Mage Knight. Stop it. And I've that, only begun. And that is the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. Moving on from our Eurus, the as yet unnamed retrospective intro segment, we now proceed to the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, games. you were nice games. You were nice enough to show me a pre-copy that we got from the de designer called Vengeance, Roll, and Fight. So what you're doing in this, you have this big map that's laid out all these thugs, and apparently it's time for them to get robbed as you bust in, shoot them all dead, and steal their stuff, and you may or may not kill the boss. It all depends on how many points you want to get. <laughs> This is increasingly my frustration with Vengeance Roll and Fight. I really do like it mechanically. Mechanically, I think it really represents a step above your standard roll and write. It doesn't feel like paperwork. There's a serious time pressure. There's a pressure to build your die generating engines, which you can do via getting new abilities and getting items to compensate for what your dice aren't going to give you or for what abilities you just couldn't be bothered to purchase via the dice rolling in the first phase. The problem is that uh, thematically... After every session, I, I'm left here looking at the trail of carnage that my character has wrought. And thematically, this is supposed to be a revenge movie. In Vengeance the Normal Game, there's actually a process by which you play cards and the cards describe what terrible things have been done to you and who did them. In Vengeance Roll and Fight, all of that is ignored. And so Walker's exactly right. You, you leave covered in the blood of your dead enemies with a whole bunch of diamonds stuffed down your shorts. And I'm always left asking the same question. Am, am, am I, am I, am I the a-hole here? Am I the, and you know, out of context, you really are. And so I, this is, this produces not only cognitive dissonance for a fan of the original game, but it also really puts a doubter on things. But what it does do is sort of put, uh, uh, Project Elite in a competitive mode. Cause like for me, it does have that feeling. Cause just like in Project Elite, you have these little recipes of dice that you have to, to, to manage, but unlike Project Elite, you sort of, you roll, you roll the dice as quickly as you can, but then you save those dice and then you sort of get all these little combos up, either you're punching or you're shooting or, or you're doing all sorts of other things. And the, and the sort of drawback is that you can roll the wound and then you got to sort of manage how you're going to deal with that. 
And um, I, at first I wasn't sure about how that would, how that would play out because there's a limited pool of dice and it's sort of whoever gets them the fastest. And sometimes those games don't work out too well. It's like, you know, flip a card and whoever can slap it the fastest. You know what I mean? One of these, <laughs> you know, these, these, you were worried it was going to be jungle speed. Yeah. One of these silly games where it's like whoever, you know, ghost blitz for like 20 minutes, you know, but. What do you got against ghost blitz, man? Nothing. I love, I, lo- I love ghost blitz. Nothing, but it's like a one time anyway. <laughs> this is like ghost splits over and over. You know what I mean? I, it, you, it's not. It's I think not you have something feel. against ghost splits. Ghost splits is great for ghost splits. It's not what I want in <laughs> in a like a roll and write sort of shoot okay. up vengeance game. Fine, but it it worked out just fine. We sort of kept track on how many dice people were using every round, and it worked out to be roughly even. I'm looking forward to to definitely playing this game more and seeing it develop. You know, over its Kickstarter push. Make no mistake, my thematic misgivings aside, I really do love the mechanics of Vengeance Roll and Fight. I think it's very solid, and it offers a new perspective on your standard frenetic real-time games, because in your static frenetic real-time games, the execution part afterwards is typically very procedural. Even in games that we love, like Space Alert. Space Alert, you play for 10 minutes, and then you resolve for another 20, and during that resolution, hilarious things happen, but there are no choices involved. Galaxy Trucker, in my estimation, progresses a little bit on that formula because, yes, there's the frenetic ship building, and then you have some choices in the cards that come up. As far as Vengeance Roll and Fight is concerned, though, you have the frenetic dice rolling to queue up all the abilities, and you have a vague sense of what you're trying to go for, and then when it comes time to use those abilities, you then interact with the map, and you have to be very, very careful about what you're doing, where you end up, and what order you use them, and all those things. And so the number of choices you get after the real-time phase is really impressive, and so I don't feel like I'm fiddling with things i really I, I look i like project elite but i'm often just going back and forth between my dice and have to fiddle with the board and figure out which aliens to move and then suddenly i'm shoveling a whole bunch of plastic and that's okay but i really do like the way that vengeance roll and fight plays with those two different timing modes and it comes together in a really solid pa- package i really hope and i don't know what plans are involved i don't have any inside information as far as this concerned that over the course of what development time there is left between now and publication that they really do try to bring it more in line with the thematic excellence of Vengeance, the original game. And that is Vengeance Roll and Fight, Episode 1, by Gordon Kalea, Norley Lubbers, and David Zurtze. It's going to be on Kickstarter by Mighty Boards this year. You also let me play Aquatica again, because we, uh, we played it online earlier, just the, the normal version. And then we got to play it with the new expansion, which is called Cold Waters. And I'm glad... I played it back to back like that because after the first game of playing just the normal Aquatica, I was pretty well done with it. It was, it, it really felt heads down and very little interaction and something I just couldn't, it's what, it's just falls into the same thing as I, you know, said with Robo Rally or, or, um, Mage Knight? Not Mage Knight. Steampunk Rally where, People are doing these intricate mechanisms and combos and you have no idea. You can't see what they're doing. So you have no idea, you know, how they're doing these things. So this is what was happening in Aquatica. It's like, okay, blah, blah, blah. This guy scores, you know, twice as many points as I do. I have no idea how he did it or, you know, what actions he took to do that. But anyway, the expansion brings this all back around with more cards, more interesting, you know, victory conditions and abilities that you can do and sort of slow, not, I shouldn't say slows the game down, but makes it flow a little bit better and, and lets you see exactly what's going on. I don't know about a greater degree of transparency. I think that might just be because we went from playing with four players, which is probably not Aquatic at its best. I'd play it again with four. It's a quick enough game, but that's not when it shines the most. And the fact that we were going from tabletop simulator to not tabletop simulator, because I find tabletop simulator very alienating because it's very difficult to juggle all the information that you're being presented with, as opposed to just being able to glance around the table. It did introduce a couple of very interesting change-ups. You did mention the victory conditions. Now there's this idea that you're, it's weird, you're almost buying points, but you're almost not. Uh, Now, instead of just meeting these arbitrary end goals, you have to purchase these end goals, but you pay for them with a combination of points and money. And it changes the fundamental economy of the game in a way that I find very satisfying. I I I felt it shook things up rather considerably. in a very pleasing way. The other thing that it does is it introduces a kind of combo system. In Aquatica, you have all these character cards, and you play them one at a time. It's it's very much like Concordia in that you have this deck that's entirely in your hand. You play a card, you do what it says it does. You have a card that brings all your cards back. I have termed these deck management games, a combination of hand management and deck building. This isn't yet to take off. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'm just trying to be clear, Walker. I'm not married to this particular bit of terminological flourish, but there we are. But in some, some of the cards in Cold Waters have a, effectively a combo effect. While this card is on the top of your discard pile, you get this bonus. So you can set things up 
turn to turn. And that was neat. It wasn't a huge strategic horizon, obviously. It's just two turns in a row. But I thought that that was an interesting influence on both the cards that I was purchasing and the order in which I would play the cards in terms of the timing. And so I, I was very pleased with the overall experience. I think that Aquatica, with the Cold Waters expansion, is a very good, lightweight, Euro, not-quite-engine-builder efficiency thing. And I definitely think that although it is best with lower number players, I will, with the expansion you can play with up to five, I don't think I'd ever play with five. But I'd play with four again, I think. Yeah, I liked how it brought the currency back in. Before it was mostly all just getting military strength and this, you know, double down on on the on the money aspect. Absolutely. And I liked how it, you know, sort of, whereas it was an afterthought, not an afterthought, but, you know, something you, knew, you did just to buy a couple of characters during the game, this made it a much bigger part and an actual strategy for the game. Yeah, you have to worry about the timing of when to use your cards to get various effects, kind of like Mage Knight. Just like Mage Knight. Is this is this the Mage Knight episode? I don't know, Walker. You're the one who always compares things to Mage Knight. I'm, okay. I'm trying to I'm trying to Okay. I'm trying to build bridges here. Gotcha. And you slap my hand away? All right. That's kind of a mixed metaphor, I suppose. That was Aquatica Cold Waters by Ivan Tazovsky and Arcane Wonders. We get to play a review copy of Excavation Earth that was sent to us by the publisher. This is another game by Gordon Kalea and also designed by David Tsurtse and Y. Yi, put up by Mighty Boards. They are finishing up fulfillment for the Kickstarter for Excavation Earth. And this was a bizarre economic Euro game. It is the kind of game that has a number of hurdles to it. In Excavation Earth, every action corresponds to a card. And every card has both an icon and a color. Sometimes the card a color matters, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the icon matters, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes neither of them matter. And then sometimes it's another symbol you care about. And on the face of it, it's relatively straightforward because, again, there's only a small number of bits of information on each card, unlike, say, Mage Knight. But the net effect of it is that you're looking down at your player aid, constantly trying to remember what cues off of what. It reminded me a little bit of Age of Industry, in that Age of Industry only has two different types of cards, but people are always forgetting about how they interact with each other and what conditions are satisfied by what. It is sometimes surprising to me how the simplest of distinctions can be the most difficult to get around, because the other processes of Excavation Earth, many of them were very straightforward. Specifically, I'm talking about the economic aspect. Because another area where Euro games often differ is how and when they decide to model supply and demand very via various market systems. And again, one of the comparisons I would draw is with Age of Industry. Age of Industry has a very, very simple supply and demand element with respect to both iron and coal, depending on how much is entering the system and who decides to build what. The two different goods can be in lesser or greater amounts of supply, and it can be more or less remunerative to refresh the supply of those particular types of goods. I think the best euro at modeling supply and demand is probably Food Chain Magnate, because in there, players are both directly influencing both. You can generate the supply ex nihilo by playing certain professions. You can also generate the demand ex nihilo by advertising to people. People aren't thirsty until you remind them about the existence of Coke. This is how the world works. Anyway, bring this back to Excavation Earth. It has this lovely little two-step supply and demand mechanism, whereby there can be a whole bunch of buyers on the market that want to buy a particular kind of thing. You then sell that good and you get a tremendous cash influx, cash being points in Excavation Earth by virtue of that. And then the buyers don't immediately go away. They go into a kind of interstitial waiting area, such that part of the demand that they were generating is still represented in the system, but part of it isn't. And so it doesn't immediately swing back and forth that you see in a lot of other supply and demand elements. There's more a slightly more organic two-step ebb and flow. That part I thought was great, and it was one of the more approachable elements of, of the game. And the more I thought about it, the more I appreciated it. Because again, thinking about supply and demand as modeled in Euros, a, another good one that does it is Navigador. But Navigador by Matt Gertz does do that kind of rubber banding thing. It's like, okay, there's no gold on the market. All right, I'll refine gold. Okay, well, now gold is plentiful, plentiful again. And so it doesn't have that sense of slight evolution. There's no stock floating or anything like that, so we're not talking about a thoroughly robust stock element. But the supply and demand elements of Excavation Earth, trying to get the things that are really, really valuable at the time of and then making big sales, that part was cool. And then there was a lot of other stuff. Yeah, well, that, that's I just want to touch on that. I Absolutely. like it. More than the other games where you can swing the market massively in one direction and, and take huge advantage, which you can't do in this game. You could, like you said, it's a two step process. So you can see what's going on. You can sort of sabotage that person or slow them down and make it sure it's not so lucrative as it would have been. Or you can set it up that you can get both done during your turn, both actions and make it semi lucrative just for you, but not wildly out of control like it is in other games. Yeah, and you have to set up for a sale, and there are a couple different ways you can do that. And it was one of those things where in the first round of the game, we were constantly checking the, the player summary again and again, figuring out, okay, how can I do this this simple thing? 
And then the stales started to happen and light bulbs went off everywhere. It's like, oh, that's how you make a lot of money. That's cool. And then we kept making other little discoveries. Like in round three, we finally recognized the value of the command action. We hadn't really been doing the command action up to that point. Because again, there was a lot to figure out. It's a middleweight euro and nothing you do is particularly complicated. But there's a lot of levers to pull, and it's not immediately transparent how different ones do there. The theme is also very grim. I wish it I wish it leaned into the theme a little bit more. The theme is that we're alien merchants slash archaeologists. I think more like looters. <laughs> I don't know. The line between one and the other is very much the eye of the beholder. You know, the British Museum is an active crime scene. Uh, so it's an uninhabited earth. No mention is made about why it's uninhabited, but I don't imagine it's because everyone decided to go to vacation to Mars on the same day. And all these different alien races, who, by the way, we were very compelled by the art. The different aliens look very cool. And they show up and they start excavating things like, ah, I want to sell this license plate. This is my artifact from Earth. So that part was neat. I wish they, they leaned into a little bit more. And in point of fact, some of the things don't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Like one of the main ways you get points isn't even by buying or selling artifacts. But when you take artifacts, you take a sample of them and put a security guard to show off the sample in your kind of ship-based museum. Doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense, but that's how you do it. Anyway, I enjoyed Excavation Earth. There's a lot going on in a good way, but there's also a lot going on in a less good way. It, it, it's one of the characteristic elements. I don't want to, when it's a design team, I don't want to assume that one person's more responsible for something than another. I, I have no idea as to the uh, design philosophy of Yi, one of the co-designers. And Gordon Kalea was, was represented in the box as given second billing. It said David Surtse and Yi with smaller font, Gordon Kalea. So I don't know who's responsible for what. It felt a lot like David Serte to me in the sense that there's a lot of these mechanisms going on and there's a lot of clever bits, but I wish it had come together in a slightly cleaner way. But I do remember the supply and demand element and I really think that that is a very interesting innovation and I'm very pleased that we were able to give it a try. Yeah, and like I said, a second play will be great. There's a huge wall of learning and I really feel as though bringing new people in would almost be disastrous, right? Because you could util, you know, utilize quick sales off the beginning before they even understood, you know, how the game developed sort of thing. And I'm wondering, you know, by the time they, you know, grasp all these different concepts or how all these different actions intertwine and how they get you points. That was the thing. Like a lot of the actions made sense. You do this and that and that, but how it all wrapped around to get you points in the end wasn't immediately clear. I'm inclined to agree. I think that there's going to be a significant barrier to entry. People who are playing for the first time are probably not going to have a whole lot of place to compete against people who are experienced. But one can hope that with a little bit more experience, my rules explanation will at least get a little bit better. So there's that. Anyway, so it sounds like we're both looking forward to another play. And so probably more to follow about Excavation Earth. Once again, this was a review copy we got from the publisher and designed by David Surtse and Yi with Gordon Kalea. Just going to say that I'm playing more micro macro just because it's so easy. You put the map on the table, you grab a little portfolio of cards, and then you have a wonderful time. It's just that simple and easy and fun. And then when you're done, you put it back in the little wax envelope, fold up the map, and you're done with your wonderful little experience of micro macro crime city. Your delightful dalliance into the realm of murder. Yes. <laughs> All the different little bodies that you find and, you know, around this little alley. It's like, oh. There is another dead body I had not seen yet. <laughs> I wonder if they'll be relevant later. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Micro Macro Crime City. If you haven't checked it out or read anything about it, check it out. It's a fantastic little game. You taught us Daimyo Rebirth of an Empire. This is by Jérémy Ducré and La Boîte de Jeux. This was a Kickstarter recently fulfilled. And it had, not entirely unlike Excavation Earth, but in different ways, it had bits that I really liked and bits that I thought were not particularly well integrated with the rest of the game. The bit that I thought was great was it had a relatively interesting twist on dice drafting. So there's this pool of dice from which you can draft to, to get done what you need to get done, not entirely unlike Mage Knight. And you can discard cards to increase the value of the die. But what's fascinating, and what I initially thought would be very frustrating is that the value on the die doesn't have any influence whatsoever on what action you do. They're just in three colors, three color of action. You draft the, the color you want, do that kind of action until the supply runs out. What's great is that you have these hero cards that do various effects, some of which are very consequential, and you very, very much want to trigger, and they will trigger if there are dice on your board that sum exactly to the value of the trigger on your hero card. So, for example, you could have a hero card with a value 3, 
And if you draft a three, or theoretically a two and a one, but more likely a three, you can play that card. You might have an 11, in which case, well, you're going to need two or more dice that add up to 11 exactly in order to play that card. And so what you buy in terms of the hero cards, what dice you draft in order to trigger the hero cards, managing what hero cards you're able to draw, and that part I thought was wonderful and I thought it was really, really, really cool. And I thoroughly enjoyed trying to figure out my drafting needs with respect to my hero needs and managing my hand in that way and timing the element of playing the cards. And all all the stuff that was on the cards was very interesting too. There was nothing like it was super powerful. All of them had interesting abilities and how they interacted with the game. And there was one part of the drafting that we didn't like the fact that uh, the blue action seemed very powerful and useful and there was only two dice. So someone was always going to be left out of the blue action and it seemed almost you know, necessary that it was going to be drafted almost first because it gave you the first player, which gave you first draw of the dice. It just seemed one of these things that maybe didn't work out quite so well. I only strongly objected to it in the first rounds of the game because the, the rest of the game is essentially an area majority contest you're getting influence on these tracks, which are which are basically just a running tally of your force presence in given areas, and you score at the end of every round. As the rounds go on, the stakes go up and your flexibility goes up. And so then sometimes you want to be last because in any, any area majority contest, you want to be able to go last because it's hugely advantageous. But in the first rounds, eh, you're still trying to get your infrastructure up. You're still trying to get things going. And the other actions that give you first player are also really important early on. And so for rounds one and two, especially, we, we did not like how it was seemed, again, this is, we're not experts, it seemed obvious that you wanted to just constantly take first player and get those other bonuses. So starting out last felt awkward. Now, later on, at the end of the game, I deliberately chose to go last, and I liked it a great deal, but earlier on, not so much. And again, the the rest of the stuff in Daimyo, the area majority elements are fine. The card play elements I thought were really, really, really cool, but it is attached to an area majority contest, which is relatively straightforward. And on top of that, there's other bits. There's this set collection weird thing where you have this other thing, which isn't really a troop, but it looks like a troop and it's running on the map and just getting you tokens. It felt so tacked on. It's like they designed the game and they said, well, this isn't enough of a game. We need something else here. Let's have an entirely unconnected thing. And I'm like, great. And so... And then there's the tableau building on top of that as well. So as you're putting up buildings, you get to put these little tokens in your in your tableau that get you bonus points and bonus stuff. So all sorts of little working mechanisms going on at the same time. That part was fine. That at least yeah. dovetailed with everything else, you know, uh, being able to tack on a recruit action to my build action or being able to tack on getting resources to my actions so I can help pay for it when I take it. That part was neat. I really, really liked that. I just didn't feel that the area majority contest was particularly satisfying. A lot of it was premised on potential kingmaker issues and strange spot scarcity in a not organic way coupled with the set collection aspect which felt totally tacked on yeah to take that sort of element and what i thought would sort of you know the fact that you can only do it three times maybe maybe we'll lock that down a little bit make not make it so so bad well the, the, the core problem isn't even its prevalence in, in Daimyo, there's not a whole lot of take that elements because, again, the cards that you're playing don't tend to have too much focused aggression. But the key problem is when you deploy effectively the only troops that can kill people, it costs your opponent more than you gain by playing it. And pretty much any context where that's the case is leaving itself open for king-making situations. And for what it's worth, that's exactly what happened in our game. A did something to B and then C got five points as a consequence. And you're right, it's not a huge part of the game, and it's limited to a small number of times, but any time there's spite that gives you less than it costs your opponent, I'm a little bit worried. And sure enough, it manifested itself in that way. But, you know, there's a lot to like in Daimyo Rebirth of an Empire. The theme is weird, really weird and stupid. A lot of the pieces are stupidly overproduced in the Kickstarter version with the plastic figures. Yeah. It's the very first time I ever thought that it was too much. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's totally unnecessary. It actually blocks some of the iconography, so you have to look around some of the plastic figures. It, it, it's not very functional. I think next time we play, if we play again, we should play with the wooden pieces, honestly, because they looked very nice. Reminded me a little bit of Crusaders, They Will Be Done, where you see the plastic piece and you see the wooden pieces, and you're like, I think these are equally cool. Why did you bother? And uh, one final note I'll make about Daimyo Rebirth of an Empire is I felt it was too long for what it was. We played for about two hours with three players. And uh, honestly, I think this wants to be a 75 to 90 minute game. Maybe more experience will bring it up a little. 
but it didn't feel like we were playing very inefficiently. And and to be frank, I, I should be very, very transparent, although I felt that we spent far too long for what it was, I didn't feel like the game was dragging. I, I wasn't sitting around waiting for people to take their turns forever, and I wasn't constantly checking my watch. It was one of those situations where the game ends, you check your watch, and it's like, oh, that didn't feel like it was worth two hours, and as opposed to, you know, waiting for Walker to take his turn and stop whining. Well, that's always going to happen, one way or the other. Especially in Mage Knight. Especially in Mage Knight. Is this... Do we have a sponsor? Do you have a paper? This week I played Mage Knight the board game. Mage Knight the board game is very much like every other board game ever made. Uh, this was about Vlada Kavatel at WizKids uh, 10 years ago now, actually, and is sort of the definitive heavy fantasy adventure game type thing. A lot of people have compared it to Magic Realm, not because they're similar mechanically. In fact, Magic Realm may be the only game in existence that does not feel like Mage Knight. I compare it to everything. It Really? Do you? <laughs> Have you compared anything to Mage Knight before? I, I don't know. What's I don't listen to podcasts, so I, w- I, I wouldn't know. But Mage Knight is, deserves a lot of its reputation. The downtime can be huge, which is why you probably want to play co-op. It's one of the few games where it says, oh, you can play competitively or co-op or whatever you want to do, where it actually feels relatively focused nonetheless, but probably co-op is the way you want to do it, because most of the PvP options are a little bit weird. I've only played... Uh, heavy into PvP a couple times, despite the fact that I've played a bunch of times. And it will probably double their play length as well. Doubles a bit much, but it does add on to the game length. But solo, uh, Mage Knight is absolutely fantastic because it's not going to take you very long if you have a good set of organizational schemes. You know, there's a whole bunch of different types of cards and a whole bunch of different types of tokens. I have a really, really cool foam core insert that was built for me and it helps things considerably. One of the things that I love about Mage Knight is, is I feel like the better I get at Mage Knight, the better I get at life because <laughs> this seems like a strange co- uh, comment. <laughs> But it's the every game is the same. I start out and I've got my basic cards and I've got no skills and I've 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 got no spells and I think how could I even beat the weakest enemy? This is how am I able to get? I, it takes my entire hand to walk two hexes. There's no way I'm going to be able to get anywhere. So Mage, Mage Knight is just like my life. No, Mage Knight is just like my life okay. in that. I then I then I start to overcome a little bit of that early conservatism, and then you know in the middle bits of the game I say I am become death destroyer of orcs, and I just you know murdering everything and feeling great, and then the cities show up because I, I mostly play solo conquest, and the cities show up and they're they're chock a block with enemies and they've all got special powers, and I think there is no way I am ever going to be able to do anything against these cities until I actually try, and then. <laughs> I actually work it out, and if if I if if I'm being very careful about all the abilities that I've marshaled and all the units that I've recruited and everything, I can usually get it done. And so it's one of those things where experience still hasn't penetrated through to my expectations, and I really need to start taking more risks. I need to take more wounds. I need to stick my head out more, just like life. I need... <laughs> so I feel like more experience with Mage Knight is going to help me overcome my natural conservatism. It really is a fabulous game. I think that Vlada Kavatel's design credibility, I think at this point, is beyond beyond reproach. Everyone knows how good he is. And Mage Knight, despite the fact that it's a very strange licensed property from a WizKids collectible miniatures game, and the theme is kind of silly, uh, it is a great way with some very solid hand management and deck building elements to go and murder a whole bunch of fantasy creatures for a couple of hours. And sometimes that's what I'm in the mood for. And that's what I was in the mood for this week. And so I was very, very happy with my experience with Mage Knight. Highly recommended. I couldn't say anything more. What a great solo game it is. We got to play Whale Riders by Reiner Knizia. We finally got to play it, and this is put out by Grail Games. We got to play it more than two players. We played a three-player game. I think it took like 20 minutes or even less than that. <laughs> no, it was what? more than 20 minutes, but it was awfully fast. So much game and yes. so little time. Yes. It lived up to everything we thought it did last time. Great, you know, collecting resources, fulfilling contracts, doing your two actions, taking chances on either staying where you are or trying to get out ahead of everybody. You know, just... Action efficiency at its best. Whale Riders. Incredibly straightforward again. economy, coupled with lovely little bits of trying to decide how much risk to take with your tempo, when to push forward, when to, st- when to keep still. Uh, this game was won handily by the person who ended their run second, which was an interesting sort of counterpoint. I, as usual, rushed the game. And Huey took his took a little bit more time fulfilling contracts. And you brought up the rear, and it was an interesting uh, case of Huey came in first, you came in second, and I came in dead last, despite the fact that I rushed the end of it. And which was contrary to what we had before. Who, the person who rushed the game won the uh, previously. And I really like it when those kinds of tempo elements 
are subtle enough. I mean, we should trust Reiner Knizia to balance these things, of course, right? But despite the fact that I got to the end earlier and started buying up all these pearls, it just didn't work out like it did the previous time. And so that is a credit to the variability of what's going on with the economy of well writers, and you just need to read the board better. Again, Huey compared it to Sumatra just as we did, but it's just so much more open and simple when compared to Sumatra. It just takes the essence of what is Sumatra and distills it down to exactly what it needs to be. But at the same time, it has more texture and nuance. Yes. Because you have to worry about the economical elements and you have to worry about the contracts instead of just this weird matrix of scoring the, conditions. Yeah, or the drudge along the path, right? Where, right. Yeah. So just a quick note on King's Dilemma. We played a game called Sashin. Shasin. Sha that, That's the one we played. And we complained the fact that it had very compelling questions, but then the outcome went so off the rails from where the question started at that it was a little over the top. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm afraid that we fell into this, I feel, with King's Dilemma a little bit for the first time. Normally, the the little, you know, back and forth we have with, with the the events or, you know, the things that come up in the in the kingdom, and it sort of leads to something that you could understand or control or or see coming this time it, it went so far off the rails that it was it, it took me a little bit out of the game I'm i was wondering what you thought of i game. i could not disagree more I, I i very 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 strongly disagree i felt that what happened was although not your intended result for the policy that you voted for it was a legitimately foreseeable result and I'm afraid in order to get into details, we'd have to get into deep spoilers, which we will do we will later not. on. In yeah, the I was being very careful. I just thought it was yeah. an interesting comparison where, and that is the King's Dilemma. We're having fantastic time with it. It is, we have some uh, Patreon recordings that we do where we tell you all about it. King's Dilemma. I also got to play Takenoko for the first time. It's a wonderful little panda game. I don't know why I never had a chance to play it. It's a great little, you know, intro game where you have these limited actions and you, you get to do two actions a turn, but you can't do the same action twice. So you got to sort of figure out which one is going to get you the best, you know, bang for your buck. And you got to also make sure that you have, you're upkeeping your victory point card. So you're like hopefully falling into things that are already present on the board or easy to achieve. It's got this very interesting back and forth. Uh, I feel as though it has some odd tricky bits that, pull it back from being the you know a really great gateway intro game like this weird where a lot of the different tiles have special abilities and then there's this weather aspect and just these little you know funky bits that i think will confuse people and not make it you know a great game that it could be i, I agree takenoko is f- takenoko is fun but i feel like to a certain extent it's in an awkward middle position right where you're right it's a little too tricky to be uh, a solid intro game but at the same time i didn't it didn't strike me as having quite enough legs or meat to it. Not like, you know, again, like the genius of Reiner Knizia designing something like Whale Riders, where it's incredibly simple and approachable, and you require practically no refresher in terms of how it works, but it, nonetheless it offers some diversity of play experience and choices. So, But yeah, no one can deny that Takenoko is adorable. And then this Saturday, we played the Red Cathedral. Every Saturday morning, we... Twitch stream a game. This week was Red Cathedral. Next week, it's going to be Spirit Island. So come on and check it out at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. I, I'm as shocked as you are, but Walker suggested that we play Spirit Island. I'm looking forward to it. I'm probably going to play Shadows Flicker Like Flame because every time I see Shadows Flicker being mentioned online, they are being slandered as <gasps> being weak. How dare they? Shadows Flicker, I, I maintain, is a solid spirit and capable of some serious, serious work. Of, of course, I'm not setting myself up as the person who can demonstrate that. But <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I hope to see you on Saturday morning for Spirit Island. And those are the games we played last week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So news from Mind Clash Games. Their next release is going to be Voidfall. This is pitched as sort of a Euro 4 x thing, even more Euro-y than Eclipse, kind of, sort of, but it's hard to tell at, at this stage, by Nigel Buckle and David Zirkze. Um, I'm a, I confess I'm a little bit disappointed by this announcement for a couple of reasons. Number one, I really like the work of Aman and Peter, the other core designers of Mind Clash. And number two, the art design is being done by Ian O'Toole. 
And so when I hear that Mind Clash is releasing a game by David Circe and Art by Eno Tool, I'm like, what's separating you from every other Euro publisher in the world? Because, look, I love a lot of David Circe output, right? But he's very much the in-designer now, and he's everywhere. And so one of the things that's been great about Mind Clash is how unique a lot of their offerings have been. Yes, Anachrony was designed by David Circe, absolutely. And he's done development work and some work on the solo modules for the other Mind Clash stuff. But... I, I'm, I, I, I'm, look, I'm optimistic. I really love Mind Clash. I'll try anything they put out for now. They've, they've got a solid record as far as I'm concerned. And I am curious about Voidfall. I love sci-fi games. And Nigel Buckle, everyone who's worked with him swears he's the best designer you've never heard of. But at the same time, I wonder if this is, you know, a sign that they're just going to be a little bit more like every other mainstream publisher. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being a curmudgeon. My only bit of news is some Games Workshop news. It's like many decades ago, I collected this great set called Gaunt's Ghosts. It was sort of like a 12 pack of these unique Imperial Guardsmen. It was, they were sort of like based off of the Dirty Dozen, right? So they're all very <laughs> unique and interesting. So they're reissuing those, but unfortunately this time there's only six of them, which what? doesn't make, yeah, it's a six piece plastic set. It's huh. got all this fancy, if you're into that kind of thing, definitely look it up. It's got like, you know, that comes in a tin and comes with paperwork and oh. all sorts of fancy stuff and Gaunt's Ghosts from Games Workshop. I have some bad news that's peripherally connected to Games Workshop. Richard Halliwell, designer of Space Hulk, one of the all-time true greats in the board gaming hobby, has passed away. Uh, Richard Halliwell also designed Block Mania and Rogue Trooper, and by all accounts was a splendid human being to work with. I never met the man, uh, obviously, but I am nonetheless a huge fan of his work. I am a uh, massive appreciator of Space Hulk, and I thoroughly enjoyed Block Mania. I never tried Rogue Trooper, but now I might try to track it down. And so that is a tremendous loss of the hobby. Rest in peace, Richard Halliwell. He will be missed. Other sad news in the hobby area, although not as sad. This was passed on to me by a game publisher that I know of who arranges for shipping. And he commented that he was recently quoted a shipping cost from a container from China at 12000 American dollars when the same container a year ago would have been somewhere around $3,500. And so this represents a more than threefold increase in the cost of shipping. And this is, of course, assuming you can get a slot, because anybody who's backed any Kickstarter over the course of the past year has been regaled with stories about how, well, they swear the train's going to leave tomorrow. Oh, it didn't leave. They swear that the container's going to be loaded onto the boat this week. Oh, it didn't get loaded onto the boat. And so this is a, a, a bad harbinger of things to come, given the fact that everybody manufactures in China. And even if you don't manufacture in China, you're going to be getting components from China because that's just where dice and plastic comes from. So perhaps uh, portents that supply lines are going to be fragile for a very long time in the future and that prices might be going up. And the fact that a lot of these, you know, shipping costs are already locked in. And, you know, it's going to be coming up. So it's going that's to, true. Some people might be in some trouble. Yeah, some existing publishers who already have commitments might be taking a bath. And that's happened a number of times before, even without uh, extraneous or force majeure situations. So it could be very, very bad for a lot of people. So in more media news, I, Walker, am an appreciator of the of the associated works of thespian Mr. Vincent Diesel Esquire. But I'm not really – It's it's strange. I love his movies, but I've never seen any of the Fast and the Furious movies. I tried watching one of them and got bored after about 20 minutes and stopped. But his other stuff is, is marvelous. This is a man who basically made an entire fanfic of a D&D character and turned it into a movie. You have to appreciate someone who's able to do that. And in this movie, he actually said, this is my sword. It's called Witch Slayer. <laughs> nice. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I mention this because there's going to be a Fast and Furious highway heist designed by Prospero Hall. I love Prospero Hall stuff. Usually it's good for a laugh or two. Sometimes it's only half of a laugh, like the Godzilla. But sometimes it's good for several laughs, like Top Gun. And I am very curious to see what they do with it. And I am curious if it is going to be graced with the very handsome, dashing good looks of Mr. Vincent Diesel Esquire. Anyway, that is going to be Fast and Furious highway heist by Prospero Hall. That is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now, on to the topic of the week, which is market differences. Video games versus board games. So, Walker, you had an interesting thesis that you wanted to share with me the other day. I did. Yeah. I did. No, I should have said, I, I, did. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that to sound like a question. I, I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, why don't you share this thesis with us now, Walker? My thought was that there's always comparison done between video games and board games. And the question is asked, will board games ever become as popular as video games and why hasn't it and what do we need to do or what barriers are in the way 
So I thought it would be a great discussion and maybe we could hack, hack out some of these concepts that I thought of. I'm absolutely happy to do that. I mostly want to talk about some of the fundamental differences in terms of the modes of consumption of the two. Maybe you might have thoughts on whether or not this represents reasons why the board game market will never be as mainstream as the video game market. I don't like speculating as to sales, but I'm more than happy to comment on your speculation. Well, speaking of sales, Mark. Speaking of sales. The ones that were available were from 2019. Okay. Board games, $13 billion. Okay. Okay. Video games, $151 billion. That is a considerable difference. I'm actually surprised it's not a bigger difference. True. So. And I'm probably responsible for at least half a billion of those dollars. So why are these things? I was just, I think I only have one thing at the beginning of this. Why are they compared to each other? I think it's just the competition of our free time, right? Yes. Our free time is very limited or everyone's free time is very limited. And when you have some time to do something, is it going to be a video game or is it going to be a board game? And I really feel that this is a question that a lot of our listeners have. Besides, if you wanted to classify them as, both as interactive forms of entertainment, then they both form a natural class. Unlike other bits of cultural artifacts that are uh, appreciated I'm going to say more passively in terms of the activity. I don't mean to say that watching a movie or listening to music is purely passive. I mean, obviously, there's tremendous intellectual stimulation that you can get, especially if it's a Vin Diesel movie. I've never, ever thought about life and problems and the world and my role in the in the universe nearly so much as when watching Mr. Vincent Diesel. But nonetheless, it doesn't require any active input from the consumer of the of, of the of the media, whereas both board games and video games requires the active participation of the consumer. So I think the two, I've written down all sorts of points, but I think just looking at them briefly, the two biggest ones, why uh, video games are, are so great. I shouldn't say great. <laughs> why? So this is less of a prediction and more of a value judgment. Board why? games aren't going to make as much money as video games, and that's good because oh, video sorry, games are great. I got it. Why video games are doing so well. It's the instant gratification. It's like, I want that video game. Boom, you can download it. You can be playing it within seconds. And there is an unlimited stock. There is no shelf space it's taking up. There's no worrying about anything like that. The, the distributors don't have to worry about keeping you know stock or anything. It's boom, I want to download this. I give you money. I get it. I'm playing it immediately. I, I agree with you. I have the exact same words written here. It, it is instant gratification. I don't mean, I want to be very, very clear. I'm not being sarcastic here. I don't mean that as a judgment. No. Normally when instant gratification is used, that's thrown out as some sort of pejorative as though anything is better when it's made difficult or anything is necessarily better when you have to wait for it. I don't buy into that nonsense. No. Just because it's, just because suffering is involved doesn't make it more worthy. Uh, but yeah, if you want a game, especially if it's an indie game, especially if it's uh, of a smaller size and it doesn't have, you know, a, a 50 gig day one patch, you want it, you pay electronically with your credit card and it's instantaneously on whatever machine you have, whether that machine is your phone, your PC, or even a console now. And with digital distribution increasingly becoming the norm, I don't have the sales figures, but that's definitely been my perception. You don't have to worry about storage except in the digital space, but digital storage is is uh, fungible and easily transferable. You can delete the old game to make room for the new game and then download the old game again if you're so inclined. And you don't even have to worry about storing those boxes like you used to. And then, like you said, the patch. So there's your game's instantly updated. Sometimes there's stuff fixed that you didn't even know was broken in the first place. And there's also a built-in tutorial. You know, you don't have to look up videos. You don't have to read a rule book. It's actually part of the game. It'll teach you how to play. Absolutely. In, in a more interactive way as well. You could, because again, regardless of how good the learn to play videos are, they're not going to walk you through it in quite the same way that a sort of well latticed tutorial will do in a video game context. Not that they're all good tutorials. Some of them are really bad. But that actually dovetails with one of the interesting differences I have as, as a consumer of video games versus board games. And that is, and I, but I do want to go back to the issue of patching later on, because that's a huge controversy in, in board is. game versus video games. I find that video games have less time to impress me than board games do. I don't expect a board game necessarily to be firing on all cylinders, even after the entirety of a first play. I mean, we just talked about here in terms of uh, Daimyo and Excavation Earth to, to pick two very different games that we had our first plays of that we want to go back and see more of. We already spent more than two hours with these things. We're not 100% sure yet, and we want to go back. I, if, if I was not sure about a, a video game after two hours, 
I, I, it would be gone. Oh, it's not even that. It's like you get into character creation. It's like, what? I can't pick my hair color? <laughs> Uninstall. <laughs> I'm not that bad. But if I'm, uh, and honestly, it doesn't matter how long the game is. It can be a 180 hour game. It can be a 10 hour game. If I'm completely unengaged for the first hour or possibly even the first half hour, that's it. I'm gone. I agree. Hmm. Here's That's another the, thing. I just find that an interesting difference, especially yeah. given how much less effort is involved. You'd figure that given the barrier to entry in terms of my effort is so much lower. Well, I'm wondering if it's the – because you had – Maybe had, it's because my barrier to entry is so much lower. I think it's because you had to wait for it to show up. You had this anticipation of it arriving. You went out and bought it. It's You didn't instantly – you know, it's not as though I hit a button, boom, it's there. I can, I can grade it. I don't like it. Boom, it's gone. I can get something else. I think it's actually the social element, honestly, because – if I – let's say I only played board games solo because when I play sol- a solo board game, I'm still kind of sort of aping or imagining it to be the, 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 the equivalent of a social experience. But if I only played board games solo and they never involved the participation of anybody else, it might happen the same way. Maybe in a perfect world, if you're playing a four-player game and you're half hour into the game and nobody's feeling it, you'd pack it away. But we would never do that. That would be perverse. And maybe that's the salient difference. I don't know. I'm just speculating. So you want to go back to – uh, the patches. Oh, sure. Patches I'd be happy to go... into the, cause, uh, video games are upgradable. It's yes. like sometimes they're free little, you know, things or it's, or a quick downloadable addition or a couple dollars to get you extra stuff. Well, paid expansions are comparable, right? You can pay to expand a video game in, in sometimes in exactly the same way that you can pay to expand a board game. But what I find fascinating is when people start talking about patches and they in in the board game sphere and they invariably start analogizing it or disanalogizing it to the video game sphere. I remember in particular when David Serlin used to engage on Board Game Geek and elsewhere. He has wisely decided to stop. I think that was a good policy and mostly he doesn't publish board game he hasn't published board games in a while. He's pretty much focused on his video game stuff because he put out uh four different editions of Flash Duel within a very, very short period of time. He put out three different editions of Puzzle Strike within a relatively short amount of time. And he offered, he initially intended to offer zero path for previous owners to get the new versions. And it was an awkward space because people were like, well, you know, usually when there are balance problems in a video game, you fix them for free, right? And David Serlin's response, despite coming from the video game world, is this isn't a video game, this is a board game. You have all the components. I'm not going to bother giving you an upgrade. He eventually compromised and gave pseudo upgrade packs in a couple of instances. But he, he was always hostile to the idea, which is odd because in a lot of other ways, his his sensibilities were very much fixed in the video game world. I personally feel like it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. I, I, and I think it depends a lot on context. What, what do you think about different editions and board games and upgrade packs and so so forth? Uh, I think it's pretty rough. Bra- Ryan Lockett had the same problem. He had, you know, brought out a second edition of a game almost right away. A lot of, a lot of companies do this without offering any compensation. And a lot of people do, a lot of companies do it the right way. It's like Flames of War. We're going to upgrade the rule book. Here's a free rule book for everyone. So some, some companies deal with it properly and some don't. Just like I'm talking about, we're uh, hopefully about to, I don't want to talk about it, like counting your eggs before it's hatched, but mythic games. It's like, hey, Reichbusters, I'm, we're sorry. We messed it up. We've redone everything, new cards, new rule books, free errata pack going out to everybody. So some sometimes people do it right. I think that Infinity does a really good job in terms of miniatures games because they take advantage of digital distribution, right? All their rules are free always. All their unit profiles are free always. The only thing they sell is minis, and minis don't get obsolete. So at least they haven't been rendered obsolete. They might find a way to, I don't know. I mean, Games Workshop always found a way to make everything obsolete if they could. You know, oh, we now you need a different basing convention. Well, now now the magazine comes in from the side as opposed to underneath. And, right, exactly. And you're not allowed to play with the with the underslung. It's, Ab- it's- absolutely. But then there are companies like GMT who I love GMT to, to bits. They're probably all told my favorite publisher. But their works, because they don't tend to have a lot of editorial oversight, often come riddled with errata. Some of them, you just get the digital rules and you're expected to make do with it. Sometimes they do what they did recently for their releases of Imperial Struggle and Versailles 1919 and uh, another recent game, but it's a coin game, so I don't really care about it. And they'll, you know, just ship out full upgrade packs to everybody with the new cards and new boards and, and everything that need to be fixed. And so it, it can be all over the map. There's one weird thing that 
I keep thinking about Games Workshop. I think I spoke about this before that Games Workshop used to do and nobody does anymore. It would be something simple. They used to print it out in White Dwarf and said, just cut this yep. out and paste it over the top of the rule book. And I don't know why this isn't done more often. I- well, Excavation Earth did an interesting thing. They This was in the box. There was a sticker to put over the rule book like it was a legacy game. They're like, okay, sorry, we reprinted, we misprinted the rule book, uh, but we caught it in time to include a sticker to paste yeah. over the rule book right there. I agree with you. It should be done more often. So another reason why this one, it's, it, let's talk about the money. Let's okay? talk about money. Big companies don't go into board games because there's no money in board games. <laughs> why is there no money in board games? Because you have no control. Like with computer games, you have subscriptions, you have microtransactions, you can l- limit so you cannot resell these video games. And so they, the companies have a large control over their product. They can discount it whenever they want. They can put it at half price. They can set the prices at any time they want to. They just have more control as opposed to board games. I'm not sure that's correct. I agree with you that there are various aspects of controlling the distribution network, but and there are certainly no microtransactions in board games, although one could argue that Magic the Gathering is just a series of microtransactions funneling a, a, a game, but not to touch that. If you look at what Asmodee has done to control its supply line and to control its prices, and with a number of other companies like Games Workshop, Games Workshop exercises incredible control over its pricing schemes. If you sell for Games Workshop, they won't even let you, for a long time, they wouldn't even let you put their your stock on your website. You had to phone in an order like it was 1992 or something. Now, they've, they've relaxed that policy a bit. But again, Asmodee has minimal, minimum pricing policies, as do a number of other distributors. They bought distributors so they can have more vertical, vertical integration. And if you're a video game publisher, in many cases, you're completely at the whims of Valve, Apple, and or Google, who are entirely responsible for your distribution. And whereas Asmodee can buy a distributor... I don't know of anybody other than Valve that went out and just bought a new distribution network. So you've got Valve, EA, and maybe a couple of others. But by and large, you have all these other video game companies, even huge ones that are entirely at the mercy of other distribution networks. They are at the mercy, but they can release the game to everybody at the same time on the same date. And it's an easy way to get it to the reviewers and you can get videos up. They can just do the whole package a lot easier than they can with board games. True. Although, uh, just to segue into another major point about the differences between the video game market and the board game market, maybe that's just a function of a just larger media ecosystem. Now, I mean, the media ecosystem surrounding board games is minuscule in compared to the media ecosystem. Like, I, I was blown away when I first real- discovered that Forbes magazine had several staff writers devoted entirely to writing about destiny. We're talking about people who work at a major news publication and all they write about is one game. And you would never see something like that in board games and possibly not ever. uh, Well, I shouldn't say never. It would be unheard of in the current situation. Now, maybe sometime in the future, times would change. Who knows? And like, there's just a greater degree of specialization and professionalization. There are professional video game players. There are people who are professionals in the video game industry that make video games that don't know how to code. Right? Like, remember back in the day, it was very much the same situation. If you made video games, you were somebody who knew how to code, and you wrote a story, and you designed the game, and you designed the mechanics from the ground up. Now, because there are these major media enterprises, in very much the same way that you don't expect the director of the film to also always be the writer and always be the person behind the camera, you have a whole bunch of people who don't know how to use computers past, you know, word processing, and they work in the video games industry. You don't have that in the board games industry, really. Generally speaking, if you're going to be designing a game, it's a small team. You're lucky you have somebody else to write the rule book for you and or to provide some editorial guidance. So sports and racing games. Board games can't do that. It's been proven. What? Sorry. I don't even know what you're talking about. Moving on. No, no, no. Hold Um, on. Wait, back up. (laughs) Sorry. Wait, what? All right. What, Com- comparatively, right? <laughs> there are very, f- there are very. F- I'm sorry, I'm suffering from whiplash. <laughs> there are very few board games that capture the essence of what is sports and/or racing. There are some that attempt to simulate it or give you that feeling, but none will give you the same feeling as a video game. Does. Are you talking about the Twitch aspect, or are you talking about something else? No, I'm talking about the actual feeling of racing. I'm talking about the actual like essence of racing. A lot of board games try to emulate that, but none can do it better than a video game. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll give you racing, but... Uh, you think there's a sports game that... Look, I'm the last... Pr- I swore up and down that I wasn't going to talk about, you know, the experience of sport. 
<laughs> but what, what exactly you're talking about? What what video talk specifically in terms of a video I'm game saying that like captures a, the experience of playing I'm a sport? Like any of the NHL hockey or M- McFadden, not McFadden. <laughs> God. Madden. Madden. Any of the Madden <laughs> football games, any of the sports games, NBA. And all... those those feel to you like playing the actual game? Yes. Oh, okay. I, look, I'm not in a position to comment, so I just find that a strange well, admission. Comparatively to what the board games have attempted to do. Well, the way that I, I characterize this and the thing that I, I find, again, as a consumer and somebody who, who looks at the way some of the design philosophies evolve in terms of, of video games versus board games, is they specialize in different forms of immersion. And I think you're talking about that level of immersion. That's why I was asking about the Twitch aspect, right? And that's one of the things that I talked about when we were reviewing Bullet. Bullet, to me, didn't feel a whole lot like a bullet hell shooter because I didn't feel the same kind of tension and I didn't feel the same sort of claustrophobia, even though it was kind of sort of going for the same idea. But you're never going to get that kind of split-second timing immersion in a board game. I don't think even in a real-time game. They just feel like different kinds of immersion in that sense. But on the flip side of that, there's a kind of immersion that board games will often, that, that need to have necessarily, that some video games don't seek to have and some try to have and fail, and that's transparency. A board game has to be 100% transparent to the user. There can't be anything where it's like, well, I have no idea how this is going to resolve. You might not know the consequences of an action. You might be uncertain because, like in The King's Dilemma, you might open a random envelope and something wild might happen. But you know that the consequence is going to be opening an envelope, and you're not expecting like a boa constrictor to jump out. (laughs) That was a bad example, but you get the idea, (laughs) right? Whereas in video games, sometimes they deliberately obscure things. I read a fascinating article in terms of even presenting prob- the probability of various events happening. Some games just lie to you. They say there's a 5% chance of, of something happening when really it's more like 15 to 20 because they want you to feel like you pulled off some incredible cheat when it works. Destiny lies to you as well. Where you think you're shooting ain't where you're shooting. Where your reticle is is not actually where the bullet's going. They bend the bullets. And that's one of the things that makes it so such a satisfying experience. You can't pull that crap in board games. And I would argue that in very much the same way that playing a hockey game in a board, board game form, like Trick Shot, amazing game, I don't know what hockey feels like, so I can't comment, doesn't feel like hockey to you. In the same way, the fact that when I'm playing a PC game, I don't have perfect transparency with what's going on, that in some ways actually pulls me out of the experience because it just feels like a mystery to me. Does that make any sense? No, 100%. Like I said, I have here, I have some good parts now for board games. The imagination part where, where you're like the computer game tells you anything, tells you everything. There's the, the story, the, the, the cut scenes there leaves nothing open for interpretation or imagination where board games let well you, not nothing but less yes. but much less board yes. games let you fill in all the gaps yourself lets you come up with all sorts of things there's the whole socializing aspect of of course of of board games there's bluffing i have bluffing down here there's like over a computer game or anything like that, there, you, there's no way to get that essence of, of bluffing, of that, of that looking in someone's eye, of that, of those, you know, tricking them with those, you know, facial expressions or your mannerisms. To try what about to make the vidja, them... What about the vidja poker? No. Okay. It's it's not the same as as in real life. I've played tons of both, and it's not very comparable, in my opinion. One of the things that I find, I comment on this explicitly when we talk about video game adaptation, so I don't want to dwell on it too long, is that I'm amazed at the stuff that video games can get get away with that board games never could. And one of them is repetition. In video games, you can get away with incredibly repetitive gameplay. Even very good games are sometimes a very repetitive gameplay. And the characteristic example of this for me was Dark Souls. When Dark Souls, the board game, was released and it tried to capture some of that notion of grinding, people were repulsed. And I think with good reason. It's just it, some things work in video games that don't work in board games. And to a strange extent, I'm not sure that the opposite is true either. Because in terms of, of flexibility, you can do a straight port of a board game into a video game con- a context. You can't do the opposite, generally speaking, unless the video game in question was already a board game, something like Armello or maybe, I don't know, Mario Party. But <laughs> you can't just do it straight, but you can do a straight port the other direction. So what are you going to do with video games when you have no power? That's what I thought. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, so let's well let's talk about the barrier to entry, right? Because what's weird is that both hobbies can be very expensive. Yes. 
But the social barrier to entry for board gaming can be quite high. Some people just don't, and I mean, the, the, <laughs> the pandemic has been a very pointed reminder of that. Getting access to people with which to play games can be a tremendous burden for people, socially, mental, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, or even geographically. Sure, that's one of the, the benefits I have for video games is you have instant opponents. You know, whether it be the solo play or, you know, going online and finding, you know, you get matched up with someone automatically. Instant opponents. One thing that I want to really flag in terms of some of the thematic beats that I think video games have been really, really good at hitting recently that's, that board games haven't caught up. And that is, I've talked about this before, sober reflections on violence. You know, whether it's Spec Ops The Line or whether it's The Walking Dead or, or uh, This War of Mine or things like that, you can really get into that in, in an immersive way in video games. There's only one board game that I've ever played that really gets you to think about violence in the same way. And that's Meltwater by Aaron Lee Escobedo. That's one of the reasons why I love it so much, because it captures that sense of reflecting on your actions and the enormity of your of your decisions, which is why it's so much of a shame. And this is one of the reasons why, uh, as a mainstream uh, video game consumer, I don't only consume indie stuff, but a lot of the mainstream stuff leaves me cold, is that a lot of it is just power fantasy. But then again, the same is true of a lot of mainstream movies and a lot of other mainstream entertainment. And anyway, you don't have quite as much power fantasy in. That's true. You're not the main character. You're not the hero. Exactly. You're not the center of attention. Th this was actually brought to the. This was actually a question raised by Gordon Kalea in correspondence. He said one of the things that that's really tricky in game design when adapting some of the same video game stuff is that in the video game you are always the hero. It doesn't even matter if it's a multiplayer game. You get to be the star of the show. But when you're adapting things into a board game context, I think partially because they don't do power fantasies as well, and I'm, I'm probably okay with that. In fact, the one game that I think does power fantasy pretty well is Spirit Island. You feel so powerful by the end of the game, it's really quite striking. And so that's a power fantasy I can get behind. But you, you can't have the spotlight on everybody in the same way if you're trying to tell a story in board games. So just talking about Gordon Kalea's work in Vengeance, the solution to that is just to have, well, tell... Four parallel stories at the same time if you're playing a four-player four right. game. And that works and doesn't work at the same time. People complain about this a lot in terms of some board game adaptations of major properties, like Conan or Batman. There's only one Conan, there's only one Batman. That's right. If you really love some of the secondary characters, you're fine. That's not a problem. But if not, eh. Yeah, it's not so fun playing Robin. <laughs> but well, you, some people would say that. I, on the other hand. Well, you really. Well, there's one version of him that you're all about, That's right. right. What's his name? Uh, I think it's Dick Grayson is my favorite one. Okay, so you're you're big on Dick Grayson. That's fine. Uh, I would never know. I'm not really into the works of Howard. So if I were told to play Conan, I wouldn't. I don't have a great affinity for Conan. My favorite Conan is Mr. Vincent Diesel playing Space Conan. But if you told me to play the Conan game, I would only know the name of one of the characters. I would insist on playing him. But it's like you can be one of the guys that followed Conan around in one short story. <laughs> That's right. His hilarious sidekick that yeah. got crushed by the rock. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Whereas, again, in it doesn't matter what kind of story you're telling. If you want to tell the story where every every player gets to feel a hero, it doesn't matter whether you're playing World of Warcraft or whether you're playing a single player RPG. Video games are very, very good at doing that and adapting that sensation in board game context. Not easy to do. And lastly, for me, is just the support. I think the the board game industry is a much friendlier and more welcoming place than the board, than the video game industry and the fact that we have like one central website where everyone can go and get information from and the releases and guilds and forums i think that's a fantastic part of the hobby again i have no experience with the more social elements of video games so i can't really comment too much on that but it is one of the things that i wish uh, that board gaming could recapture. And to a certain extent, I'm trying not to be a gatekeeper. I'm not uh, trying uh, not to be, you know, get off my lawn situation. Despite the fact that it's all about technology, my perception has been, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm just completely off base. My perception is that video gamers have a better sense of institutional memory than board gamers do. For example, uh, my favorite game of all time is Star Control 2. But considerable effort has been made to make sure that Star Control 2, along with dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of games from the past century are still accessible and player playable by modern players. If you want to find it, you can go find it. If you want to play Mortal Kombat 4 instead of Mortal Kombat 11, you can go find it and do that. 
And among uh, amongst fighting game aficionados in particular, like just look at the Street Fighter franchise. Yeah. Every iteration, every step of development, there's still a tournament scene for that. Whereas in board games, it's a periodical model. Now, of course, this is because of the difficulties of publishing and it's a physical object, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, we're, I think this leads to the sense that when people talk about, oh, you know, a great classic, well, it was published 10 years ago. I'm not going to say that you can't call that a classic, but the games that were published in the 70s and 80s, it's harder to go back and experience those. If you want to go and experience the entire history of a franchise as a video gamer, you can do that much, much easier than as a board gamer. And I think that's a bit unfortunate. So in terms of barrier to entry, that's one way in which being a board gamer is more difficult if you just want to get that entire scope. Not that you have to do that to call your... I'm not saying you can't call yourself a port gamer unless you've played this list of canonical games. I'm just saying the periodical model has made it more difficult to get a full scope of the history in the same way that video gamers can. And just lastly for me is the fact that you need... There's a little bit of entry, right? You either have to purchase your console or your PC to get in. And there are sort of like lanes for that. You know what I mean? Then you're only in that sort of... That one sort of yeah, column. Yeah, enforced balkanization. Yeah, yeah. And and as a result, you get weird console wars, which is so bizarre. Like, yeah, board game geeks will argue over whether this area majority game is better than that or other area majority game, of course. But they're not going to argue that games on this material of board are necessarily superior to all games on this material of board. Well, these have plastic coins and these have metal coins and, and the one with metal coins is far superior than yes. the ones with plastic coins. Yeah. Anytime someone on board game geek shows up and says, well, this game has miniatures, therefore it must be terrible or the opposite. They're usually laughed out of the room. <laughs> and I think for good reason. And that's kind of how I feel when I see people engaged in console wars, which is, I don't know. Please send all your hate mail to support at our Canada.ca. And on that note, thank you very, very much for joining us here on So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! I miss Phase 2. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>